Uh, Professor, welcome back. Are you willing to uh, take a few calls and questions? Sure. Okay, good. We'll see, where, we'll see where it goes. You never know. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, hi, you're on the air with uh, Professor Paris. Um, hi, Professor. Um, I have a little bit of knowledge in this subject matter. I was wondering if I could ask you a couple of questions because I've heard you know people discuss on various shows you know propulsion systems, and they always lose me once they get into their, this uh, anti-gravity language and zero-point energy, and, and even when you're talking about you know warping space, because I think there happens to be a uh, simple process for ordering the direction of magnetic forces to get a propulsion effect. And I don't think you need that kind of language to really explain it. But I was wondering, when you were describing your experimental device, you mentioned there being um, that, you know, in the experimental model, there being a couple of dipoles. And um, you talked about, you said there was a 140 uh, centimeter distance to the target and then had to do with a certain frequency that you didn't want to disclose. Are you generating... Um, when you say the target, are you generating fields between the two dipoles? Well, it's not just uh, – it's, we refer to them as tripoles, and uh, we have two panels, two arrays that are uh, focused, and we have a certain angle between those two arrays, and this is where the near field of the, the cross-action of these fields create this compression, and um, – the measurements that we have taken uh, show us that the movement goes in towards the motor. So we have redshift, we have compression of a laser beam, uh, we have movement of ferrous and non-ferrous materials that if this was electromagnetic in nature, it wouldn't be moving non-ferrous material. Mm -hmm. you, see, you see where I'm going from? Are you coming to this? Because oh, so, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking that I mean, anytime you create a source of flux, you have an electromagnetic field. And yes. if that field intersects with, let's say, let's say you have a source of flux, for instance, and you uh, in, it, in the near field you have a conductor carrying electrical current, mm -hmm. the, um, the the field from the source is going to impose a force on that conductor, right? And But at the same time, once you generate it in that conductor, itself is generating a field which is moving back towards the source and could create... Uh, an opposing force on the the source, so you'll get can canceling opposing forces, just like two magnets can't, you know, will push apart or pull together. However, there is a process, and when you're talking about the frequency, uh, for instance, um, where you can create a situation where you either can create just a single uh, force on one element, let's say, without a react there being a reactive force on the, you know, source element, or you can create a, um, uh, let's say, a a, a, um, attractive force on one element and a um, repelling force on the other element unidirectionally in the same direction. So you're not mm -hmm. going to get opposing or canceling forces. But um, so it wasn't quite clear. If, you know, it's hard to figure out if that's what you were actually doing or if it was something a little bit different. Because uh, I don't imagine you're, you're importing any kind of uh, electrical current on the craft shell or anything like that. This is just in turn. I was thinking you were generating internal forces between your your elements or your sources of energy. And and to that degree, I was I was thinking when you're talking about the amount of energy needed, if that is what happens, and you're dealing with a specific frequency, and I was thinking that at 140 centimeters, you're talking something about 50. 53, 54 megahertz, I don't know. But um, if, if you were to bring your elements closer together, because, you know, things operate on a square law, you're going to get, you bring them twice as close, you're going to get four times more force for the same amount of energy. Well, gonna, we, we've actually conducted experiments that uh, go from go 30 centimeters out to 140, and mm -hmm. we look at the swing rates on the torsion bar. But uh, the uh, you're using the same frequency all the time when you're you're changing the distance between your that is your elements, that's but, that's but correct. And the, the, the effects oh. the effects are um, actually extend beyond the 140 centimeters that we have uh, measured. But we yeah, had to call you, it quits at, at some point because we only have limited space. And well, uh, of course, you, I was going to say, of course, you're going to get a 
a variation. You're going to go from maximum force to zero force if you're changing the distance while maintaining the frequency. But if you close the distance, you up the frequency to keep the same proportions, and you're going to get the, the effect is going to continue, except it's going to get more powerful. So the smaller you make your machine, the more powerful it becomes until you reduce it to the size of an atom, and then you can imagine the forces you're going to get, and you're going to start to discover the basis for gravity probably. But, well, you know, the, the engine itself is a constant energy in, and uh, the variation of distance was a, an attempt to show the collapsing of the fabric of space around an object. And in this particular case, we were looking at non-ferrous material and how it interacts and how it actually is attracted to the engine. Okay, it goes towards the motor in this respect. And it's in an isolated case of glass and wood, and the fabric of space literally penetrates through all of this and literally pulls it. Now, the other piece of this is we're developing a measuring device that has a set of passive Hull effect sensors, and these are our magnetic sensors. And as the fabric of space collapses uh, into the motor, it's going to pass through it all the magnetic fields that made the resonant of the normal space. And as that passes by, we're going to be able to read and measure how this grid or how the effective field looks like. So we're in the process of doing that. We should be finished with that particular experiment. I, I have a, another physicist on the team that's working on this. He's a particle physicist, and uh, he knows how to, uh, well, we designed the circuits, and what he's doing is he's building this stuff. He's printing them out and uh, putting them onto this uh, grid board. And we'll put it in front on an optics table, and we'll have it at various distances to actually try to three-dimensional simulation or three-dimensionality of looking at the actual field that's created and how it distinguishes from 100 centimeters to 50 to 25 mm -hmm. all the way up to the front end of the motor. And so we need to see how that field looks because we know that we can combine engines together and create a warp bubble. I know that I can put another array panel up on top and extend out from the uh, the dual arrays that we have. Uh, and I can uh, literally control the fields, altering them. Um, and, and this is a uh, uh, another added advantage into manipulating the fields of the warp fields. So we've uh, investigated quite a few different characteristics of this. And uh, right now... We're at that point where we need to put it all together and lift this craft off the ground and eliminate people's rolling their eyes. And you know, don't, and Professor, don't um, I'm curious, if you were to um, – obviously, you're not actually speeding through the atmosphere because you're warping space. You're getting from point A to point B in a very different way. Yes. Still, uh, there remains a question of whether there would be any atmospheric effect at all. What do you think? Uh, based on the um, testimonies of, of these pilots that I interviewed and had reviewed documents about, there was no noticeable tidal effects. Now, Al Coupier had talked about if you do have a warp bubble, that there would be intense tidal actions on the mm -hmm. outside of the warp bubble. Right. And when Gurning came out of his thing and he was over Miami Beach, there was no discrepancies. No one observed anything in the atmosphere. Uh, of any odd occurrences going on, nor the sea level, uh, ocean surface being ab any kind of abnormal characteristics there either. I have not noticed any abnormal effects of bending the light around there. But again, you know, we're only working with uh, a few thousand watts of power at this juncture. And I don't think you're going to really see any kind of dramatic effect until you get up into, say, 100,000 watts of power. Hmm. Uh, my projection is that the way this exponential curve is going, and I've run it out beyond what I posted onto the, uh, on, onto the Facebook, and, uh, man, it keeps running up, and it doesn't really go past, uh, like, 5,000 watts of power, between five and 6,000 watts at the max, and it just keeps going up in a straight line. Now, however... With that said, you know, we can get too giddy about this 
and that uh, as I continue with the methodical experiments and increase the wattage, 100 watts at a time, mm-hmm. and take those measurements as we get approach 2,000 and as we put approach 4,000 watts, we will get a better predictive line graph uh, where we have a better um, R squared value. I, I think a lot of people listening um, are getting lost in some of the technical details, don't understand how this oh, would change, sorry. and don't, oh, no, it's all right. I don't mind at all. Uh, I just, I, I'm trying to get people to understand how this would change the world. Well, have, have you it, thought about that? Yes, and a lot of it, you know, it carries a heavy weight on uh, my shoulder because of what could happen with this particular system in other words being you know for peaceful uses this thing could revolutionize the way we do business in other words transport stuff go to space exploration create an unlimited amount of jobs uh, a uh, people who want to live on another planet uh, go to the moon and start a colony go to mars uh, terraform and, and set up colonies there all of that if you turned your mind uh, from uh, fast transportation, <laughs> which is what I know you're thinking about, mm-hmm. to um, to weaponize something like this. And this is the part that weighs heavily on my mind, whether I should go through with the whole thing or just, you know, put it in the garbage can. Yes. Uh, I don't know if we're, as a as, as population, and it's not just the United States, I'm talking the world, that we're mature enough to, to know how to use a technology like this. And because if it was weaponized, uh, I think it would make a paranoia around the world that would be unfathomable. Uh, you know, with nuclear weapons being a threat right now and rogue nations getting nuclear weapons, if you could deliver something in like seconds, there's no way you can detect this thing. That's the problem. Nor, uh, nor even have a slight clue that it's on the way. It would well, just be there. And there's no way to push a button to repel it. You know what I mean? I, uh, I how do you defend yourself against something that would show don't. up on your doorstep in you a don't. second? You don't. Um, you don't. And I, right. I, you know, I can see the, um, I can see that side of it. Uh, uh, Ken, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, Art. Great show. Uh, and uh, Dr. Parrish, I'd also like to comment on some of those, uh, the last caller's effects. Yeah, go ahead. I'm a, I'm a retired aerospace engineer, and I, I was one of those guys that checked designs and approved them for uh, corporate and military aircraft. But I also worked with twin 50-watt CO2 lasers in uh, stereolitho- stereolithography. And so I have a little bit of understanding about what you're talking about. But to put it in simple forms, have you considered the fact that this might be created from a feedback loop, not from the instrument that you're supplying power to, but actually the warp that you're creating, that the warp is trying to fill in the gap of this bubble, and it's actually being um, enhanced by this, uh, like a Venturi effect, where space-time fabric is trying to fill in this bubble, Mm -hmm. and this is what's causing you to see more power out than what you're putting in. And I can take my comment off the air. Thank you. Okay. Um, More power out than power in. What we actually observed and measured was when the system begins to throttle up and create the warp field, as we notice a a negative flux into the the motor. And then it goes up to a normal um, load, I guess, uh, anyway, that's the only term I can use. It's it's not really more power out than in anyway, right? Well, this is where I'm getting at, is when you turn the thing off, there's about a second and a half where this thing puts out more power. Oh. Uh, it's the uh, the rebounding of the fabric of space. That's what I can only interpret it as, it's just juncture. Could it be electron bunching uh, onto one of the arrays, and then there's a release at the end? That's a possibility. I've looked into this, uh, kind of like similar to radio transmitter magnetrons. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a similar like effect there on electron bunching, um, uh, and so we haven't investigated that 100 percent yet because our goal is we're not going to get. I don't want to be bypassed. 
by some other team that's out there because there's a lot of other teams out there trying to develop something similar to this. And so we can't afford to stop and, you know, smell the roses here. We got to push forward uh, well with caution of bio, bio logic of, uh, you know, is this thing going to be dangerous? And we've taken those measurements. It doesn't appear that it is. And everything that we we know right now, it appears to be safe. Um, and our next step is to get this thing off the ground. Um, and any other effects there, we could study at a later date, but uh, we need to get it off the ground. All right. And, all right. Hold and, it right. That's, that's hold, what our push is. Hold it right there. 